Hello everybody, this is Finch and welcome back to the Dota Clinic. Today we're going to be talking about teamwork, cooperation, and communication. Some of the things we talked about last week was competition and how competition sometimes causes people to get verbally aggressive towards each other. Uh, today we're going to talk about how to properly approach your teammates with suggestions or critiques and kind of how you can have that feedback on a more positive scale without divulging into a just utter mess where no one gets any better or feels good about the situation. So that's how we're going to start today, and then we're going to wrap it up with some stuff about working together as a team and uh, how you can get everybody on your team to be putting in 100% effort. This episode will be a little bit skewed towards people who are playing with organized teams because a lot of these things can't 100% be carried over to strangers that you just met, and you might just play one game of Dota or one game of StarCraft, whatever it may be. You might see them for a small period of time, but you're not going to see them over a long period of time. So. If you're a person that's a part of an organized team that plays together consistently, you know, if it's work, if it's with sports, if it's with Dota, whatever it may be, keep these things in the back of your mind because the goal is is to increase the interaction and the positivity among your teammates and make you guys better. Uh, if you're a person that only plays with strangers in kind of just random games, just keep this stuff in the back of your mind because you definitely can still apply it. I'm just not saying that 100% of it applies to that scenario. Um, but you can see, I'll, I'll point out where where it works and where it doesn't, that kind of stuff. Um, but let's dive right in because we have a lot of stuff to cover today. So we're going to start with a quote. As always, today's quote comes from Coach K. If you don't know who Coach K is, look him up. He's the legendary uh, college basketball coach of Duke. And he has a lot of really good inspirational quotes. And just he's a really smart dude, and especially when it comes to kind of teamwork and all that kind of good stuff. He's kind of the, the pinnacle of a lot of that kind of stuff. So teamwork, this is what he says about teamwork. To me, teamwork is... The beauty of our sport, where you have five acting as one, you become selfless. I thought this was perfect for Dota because you got five on five. The idea of teamwork is you want to be five people, ten people, two people, whatever it may be, but you're working together as one. You always hear these stories about teams who come together and you know they, they're willing to sacrifice their teammates. You're a lot about um, in sports people taking less salary in order to bring in better people for their teams. People playing different positions to bring to better their team, all this kind of thing, where they're putting themselves after the team. They're putting the team first. There's that kind of sense of we, not the sense of I or me. Um, and you've heard that saying, there's no I in team, um, but there is a me if you if you scramble some letters around. Um, but the idea is the team comes first, the team is going to act as one unit, and everybody's on the same page. And so that is kind of where Coach K is coming from with this. And it's a really you know, it definitely keep that in your mind. And I think everybody's been a part of teams in their life. If you've never played organized sports, you've probably gone to school or worked a job where you've had to be a part of a group. And you know how much of a pain in the ass it is if someone in that group is not holding up their end of the bargain. They're bringing everybody down. Maybe they're being lazy and letting others do more. And that's very frustrating and difficult to deal with. So you want to have that sense of unity where everyone works together and everyone does an equal part but more importantly, everybody puts in 110% of their effort for that equal part. It does no good to have a team where everybody puts in 50%, and then that's kind of, you're just wasting everybody's time, you're not going anywhere. So, um, keywords, I guess, to know, we're going to be looking at groups and teams, and kind of the difference between those. Groups is just people who are, you know, living close to each other in a location, or they're classed together. So, if, uh, you know, you live in a city, or a suburb, or, you know, wherever you live, that is your group. You're part of that group of that city, that town. Um, if you go to a school, you're a part of that school. You're not a teammate of that school. You're just a part of that group because you're classed in there with a bunch of other people. Um, you kind of think of this as like culture or, you know, interest, whatever it may be. If you're part of, you know, chess club, then you're a part of that chess club group. You might not be best friends with everybody in that group, or you might not know everybody in that group. Um, but you're a part of that group and you kind of identify with that area. Um, the best example for this is probably university. Universities are very large. Uh, they bring people from all over the country, all over the world together to study different topics and things like that. You might not be friends with people in, in engineering. You might not be friends with people in the medical wing, but you also might not be friends with everybody in your current major, whatever it may be you're still a part of that group of the university. So how you kind of distinct that from team is a team that is a group that comes together to achieve a common goal and forming a side in a competitive sport. So just super simple, you know, baseball, football, soccer, uh, football for you people in Europe, whatever it may be, you have one team versus the other team. 
Now, the goal is for that team to obviously win. So that is kind of where you get that team distinction. Uh, some other qu characteristics that teams have, they have a collective sense of identity. There's we, like I said, we, not I, not me. It's we, together, things like that. Uh, distinctive roles. Teammates have a role to play. They each play that role really well. So if you look at a sport, if you're playing baseball, you got to have a, a good pitcher. you got to have a good first baseman. You have to have a good outfielder. They're all different positions, but they're all equally important. You can't just take one position out and expect to win anything. That's not how it works. Same thing with Dota. You have positions one through five. They're all equally important. If you just take one out, it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to play without, you know, oh, we're just not going to play a supports this game. Like, well, that's you could try. That's probably not going to work, though. It's a team. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody a part of that team knows their role and does it well. Uh, structure modes of communication. This is a fancy way to say that they communicate. Uh, if you think about a group, same thing. If you're in a university, you're not going to talk to everybody there. If you're on a team, you are going to talk to everybody there. You can you know, yell at them. You can call them on the phone, whatever it may be. You can communicate with them very directly and very easily. And um, the last one is there's norms. These are just social guidelines to kind of what the, the rules are of that group. Um, so for like Dota, it's, you know, you got to buy starting items. That's kind of an unwritten rule. You have to buy, you don't have to buy starting items. You don't have to do it. But if you're playing in a competitive environment and you want to succeed with your teammates, you're going to buy starting items. That is just what you do. They expect that of you. Um, if you don't do it, then you are outside of the norm. You're being kind of an oddball. So how do we promote teamwork and cooperation? This is where this gets tricky. Um, it depends on the dynamic of the group. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that we can go into. This episode was really, really long. I had to chop out a lot of stuff on kind of how groups form, how teams form, like the roles that the teams kind of take and all this kind of stuff. So I tried to buckle it down to more things about communication and promoting better communication amongst each other, which is why we're going to be talking about um, some of these things. So this is in the mindset of giving criticism, giving feedback, um, giving compliments, whatever it may be. This is communication between yourself and a teammate and how you want to approach that. Because it's one thing just to yell at somebody like we talked about last week and say, you're an idiot, you screwed up, this is why you're bad. It's a completely different way to rephrase that and you can tell someone, hey, you messed up, but these are the reasons why, this is how we fix it, and they're going to respond to you with, okay, you know what, I'll try that next time, rather than just pure hatred or ignoring you or whatever it may be. Uh, we want to get that communication. We want that dialogue amongst teammates because you have to communicate. It's a team game. It's a team sport, especially with Dota. You, everybody knows if you play by yourself, you're not going to have a good time. You need to play with your teammates. You need to trust your teammates. And it's a, it's a group. It's a cohesion that you all need to play together. Um, and so when it comes to cooperation, communication, things like that, uh, first rule is you must be open-minded. Uh, you must be willing to accept the fact that there's going to be other people on your group, in your or in your group on your team, that are going to criticize you. They're going to give you critiques. They're going to give you advice. You need to be open-minded and be okay with that because at the same time you're giving that back to them. So it can't be a one-way street. You can't be the only person yelling at everybody else, telling each other to do. You have to be willing to take it yourself. Uh, the next one up is going to be be constructive, not destructive. We talked about last week, kind of like being positive. And rather than trying to attack a person, you want to attack the actual issue at hand. I guess attack's kind of an aggressive word, but rather than going to a person and say, hey, Billy, you're an idiot. This is why. Just say, hey, man, I think you made a wrong decision on this item build. Uh, maybe next time you know, we'll, we'll work it out. So you're talking about the issue. You're not talking about the person and the problems and why they're a bad person. If you attack the person, they're going to shut down, they're not going to accept the criticism, and they're not going to allow that communication to flow. If you talk about the issue at hand, and if they're really truly willing to be a part of this team, and they want to get better, and they want to win, they're going to listen to your feedback because they they want to get better. If you're playing a competitive team with five people, you don't have someone on the team who wants to lose. No one wants to lose. But losing is a part of life, it's a part of the game, it's going to happen. So you need to accept the fact that they might have made a mistake. But they didn't do it on purpose, and they don't want to do that again. So by yelling at them and telling them they're an idiot or they suck or they need to uninstall, that's not going to fix the issue at hand, which is the mistake. So keep the, the criticism focused on constructive feedback on how they can fix the problem in the future. 
Um, this one is going to be more for uh, organized teams. If you're playing with the same group of five people over and over again, it's this confidentiality. It's kind of what is said within that group and is what is said amongst each other. You just stay within that group and within each other. Now, this is a very hot topic for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people think that there should be transparency and everything should be public and everything should be hunky-dory, but that's not how it is. There needs to be a sense of trust that what is said within the team, within the locker room, with whatever it may be, that things that are said are within that context and within that area. Um, if it involves the whole teammates and you know you have a, you know, a team meeting or something like that, that's totally fine. Great. Definitely do that. But we notice a lot of times people start spiraling out of control when you have teammate A talk to teammate B and say, uh, you know, hey, can you can you believe that uh, you know Jimmy over there? He's a complete idiot. He sucks. He feeds. He doesn't know how to you know buy wards, whatever it may be. Well, sooner or later, that's going to come back to him. That teammate A was talking to teammate B. <laughs> I need a little diagram for this. Um, and that's going to make the problem escalated. It's going to get worse because it wasn't. It had nothing to do with teammate B. It was between teammate A and teammate C. So it needs to be whoever's involved with the problem directly needs to be involved on the issues and the discussions on how to fix it and how to promote that more sense of, hey, we're a team, we're going this together. If you get, you know, two or three people and you're teaming up against some guy on your own team, so if you're, you know, you got two or three guys and you're gonna approach someone and say, hey, hey, Jack, you suck, uh, you know, you need to, you're bringing us down. Now that person has a sense of they're being pitted against three different people, they're teaming up against them and they don't stand a chance, they're gonna shut down. There's not that sense of open communication where there's feedback and the goal is to kind of grow together and continue to move forward and get better. Uh, the next one up is kind of along the lines of that, which is everyone speaks. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a viable viewpoint. Just because you think you're right and they're wrong doesn't mean that their viewpoint doesn't have any validity. It definitely does. So if you're going to have a teammate discussion with your teammates, make sure everyone has a chance to speak their mind. You don't want one guy talking the whole time and then four other people sitting there going, okay, that doesn't work. You need everybody to put in their own opinion and their own reasons and their own discussions and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and the last one is going to be be concrete and clear. Don't leave things up to, to interpretation. You want to be straight to the point. You want to make it very clear the communication issue that is at hand, the criticism that is at hand, the compliment that is at hand, whatever it may be, needs to be clear, concise, and direct to the point. Um, I guess the saying for this is kind of don't beat around the bush. Just go straight to it. If you think someone is, you know, buying the wrong items in Dota, then you need to say, hey, you're buying the wrong items. Don't go, hey, man, maybe, like, I don't know, I wouldn't have done that. But maybe somebody else might have. I mean, I wouldn't have done it, but maybe somebody else might have bought that item. But I don't think that was right. So you're just wasting time. Just say straight to the point. This is what went wrong. I would like to fix it next time. What do you think? That's all you have to do. So now you kind of know a basis on cooperation and teamwork and how you should be approaching each other and, you know, dynamics of a group and how, you know, people are going to react. Uh, let's talk about feedback delivery. And this is kind of how you approach the subject. And some strategies on when you approach teammates or coworkers or friends, whatever it may be, these methods are going to be better than just diving in guns blazing, trying to yell at them, and you know whatever it may be. You need to fo focus on these things at hand. So the feedback delivery, the first thing is going to be ask first. This sounds super dumb. It might be in the sense of like an online situation scenario, but if you go up to a person and they, more often than not they know they screwed up. If you're looking at a baseball team and someone makes an error, ground ball goes through their legs or they you know, launch a ball over first base, they know they screw up. You don't need to walk over there and go, uh, you're an idiot, you suck, do you, do you know why you screwed up? Like, Don't approach them like that. Just If they make a mistake, you walk up to them and go, hey, do you know what wrong, went wrong there? And sometimes they're going to say, no, I don't know what went wrong, can you tell me? And they're more open to feedback. They might say, yeah, you know what? I do know what I did wrong. I um, I didn't get my glove on the ground. The ball rolled through my legs. Uh, next time I'm going to try to get my glove on the ground. Then the problem is already solved without you putting yourself in a sense of getting into trouble or a sense of kind of the aggressor. 
Uh, a really common tactic for this is a police officer. I, if you've ever been pulled over, you know how it goes. You get pulled over, you're all pissed, you're angry, the guy, officer walks up to you. More often than not, he's going to say, hello, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? And either you're going to be an idiot and you're going to play dumb and go, no, I was not going 95 on the freeway. You're going to go, yeah, I was, I was kind of speeding, wasn't I? Because now the officer took the sense of aggression and forcefulness and he kind of diffused it down a bit because now you're understanding why he pulled you over and that it's not him thinking you're a bad person or you are an idiot or you're a criminal, but more as here's the situation, you were speeding, that is against the law, you can't be doing that. Now that kind of calms everybody down, which is the key. You don't want these things to escalate. There's nothing worse than when you approach somebody for a kind of a feedback issue or a seminar or a, I don't know, a little powwow and to have it escalate and get worse and everyone gets super intense and super emotional and angry. There's, there's nothing worse than that. You want to de-escalate the situation and by asking them if they're willing to take feedback or if they're willing to you know, understand, maybe think out the thought process on why they're wrong, it's going to diffuse the situation and it's going to bring it down to a sense where people can begin to talk rationally about things. Uh, the next one up is the sandwich approach. Uh, you've probably heard of this one before. This one's super common. I'm not a big fan of it, but it makes sense and it's super easy. So the idea is when you approach somebody with some criticism or some feedback, you're going to go compliment, criticism, compliment. The idea with this is you think you're going to you know, butter them up with a compliment. You're going to sneak in the criticism and then you're going to go, hey, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Here's another compliment. Uh, so an example of this would be, hmm. I got a good Dota example down here, so we'll try some think of something else uh, in the real. I guess I'll use the the baseball example. So you go up to your pitcher and you say, "Hey, man, you did a really good job today locating your fastball, but you hung a ton of curveballs. Um, but you did a really good job of staying ahead in the count." So now the criticism there is you hung a ton of curveballs. So if you don't know how to play baseball, if you hang a curveball, it's really bad because curveballs generally go a little bit slower. They're just kind of sitting there. They're just floating ducks. They're easy to hit. They're not a good thing to do. So you throw in the compliment, a criticism, and a compliment. Why this is good is it feels good. It's a sense of, it's like a defense mechanism for the person that is being the coach, that is being the criticizer, that is the critiquer. It's easier. It feels more comfortable because then you feel like, whew, they're not going to get, they're not going to get mad at me. They're not going to yell at me now because I gave them a compliment. Now the issue with this and that I have with this is you're kind of beating it around the bush. You're not going directly to the issue at hand. You're worrying more about people's feelings and emotions, which is not what we want to do. We want to diffuse the emotions and we want to focus on issues and, you know, objective, you know, problems, whatever it may be. So by going compliment, criticism, compliment, you're kind of, you're bearing the criticism. So they might not even pay attention to it. They might be so excited that you just gave them two compliments that they're not going to even think about the criticism, that doesn't help it. The better idea for this is you want to kind of talk it out, you want to try to figure out a solution, and you want to address the criticism directly and say, hey, this is what went wrong, it's okay, but we can fix it, let's see how we do it next time. And this is where we see the star model. Uh, this is probably, I'd say it's pretty common. It's definitely, it's my favorite model and it's probably the easiest model. Um, so we'll move on to that one, it's super easy, you'll see why it's so easy. So star, S-T-A-R, then also you have the additional A-R. Um, the additional is these alternative actions and alternative results. Um, but just star by itself. The reason this model is so good is it works for compliments and it also works for critiques. It could be used in either scenario and it's not too complicated, it's very simple. So star, S-T, the situation and task. What is someone doing or what are they not doing? So that is something positive. Hey, you did a really good job del delivering those pizzas today or something they're not doing. Hey, you did not do a good job delivering those pieces today. That is the situation at hand. That is directly to it. There is no confusion. It is direct. It's concrete. You know what the situation or the task is. Uh, the next one is action. This is what the person did. Result is what was the outcome. So now if you want to give somebody a compliment, you're going to use S-T-A-R. So you're going to say, uh, hey, John, you did a really good job delivering those pieces today. So what did the tit situation? They delivered pizzas. Action. They did a really good job delivering the pizzas. Result. Hey, John, you did a really good job delivering those pizzas today. Uh, you made $150 in tips and you saved our business. Our little pizza shop is saved. That is the result. Simple. Done. Compliment. John feels good about getting his compliment. 
The manager feels good about giving him reinforcement because next time Dunn is more likely to do his job because he likes praise and reinforcement and he feels good about himself. Very easy. Now, if you want to look at this as a critique, and this is probably what you're going to be using more often than not because people like to critique more than they give compliments, but that's just it's a whole other issue. Um, situation and task, same thing. We'll just use the same pizza example, um, but we'll use the not doing this time. So situation is, uh, hey, John, the pizza didn't make it to Cindy's house. Action. John didn't get the pizza to Cindy's house. Result, Cindy now is really pissed and she's not going to buy any more pizzas from our business. Done. S-T-A-R, but then the negative sense, and then we're going to add on these two additional things, which is the alternative action and the alternative result. So it's going to be A-A-A-R. So alternative action, you're going to say, what was a better choice? What would have been a better action? And then the alternative result is what the result could have been if they would have made that alternative result. So you don't want to phrase this as like kind of talking down to people. You want to make this a dialogue. So you're going to say, hey, John, uh, I noticed that you didn't get the pizzas over to Cindy's house, that is situation, that is action. Uh, Cindy just called and she's really upset with me and she's not going to order pizza from our pizza shop anymore. Um, you know, next time, if you're really busy and you're not able to take, you know, this many pizzas, maybe you should just say, hey man, can you get somebody else to take Cindy's pizza? Or you could say, you know, I'm going to do my best to get it there. Um, you need to have more communication because I think if you would have allowed somebody else to take the pizza, we might have been able to kept her as a customer and somebody else could have taken the tip money or something. So that is that. That example kind of got convoluted and, you know, we don't know our path, but you kind of know where it's going. Is you want to talk about the situation, the action, the result, and then say, hey, you know what, next time let's try this because I think we will get this. That's it. That's all you have to do. So we're going to use a Dota example because people like Dota and this is the Dota clinic. Dota example, situation task. We have an enchantress on our team. This is, by the way, this is like my biggest pet peeve in all of Dota. So, um, situation and task. We pick an enchantress to help push towers and support our team. We needed somebody to be the supporter. We need somebody to kind of free up farms so we could have two solo lanes. So we stuck enchantress in the jungle. The action the enchantress built Hand of Midas. Result we lose the game in 20 minutes due to the enemy pushing our base. So, an example of this would be we have a Phantom Lancer, we have Phantom Assassin, we have some late game carry, and we couldn't get to the point where that carry becomes successful and useful. So we're going to look at the alternative action and the alternative result. The alternative action would be build a mechanism first. Don't go hand of Midas, go Boots Mechanism. Alternative result, we probably could have held the base until our carry got strong enough. So how would you use this in game when you're communicating with your teammate? or you know, a stranger, whatever it may be, you're gonna say, hey Enchantress, uh, we, we picked Enchantress so we can kind of push towers and uh, you know hold off the aggression, we have the heals, uh, we kind of really needed you to buy wards and kind of protect our carry, uh, but you went hand of Midas. That's the action, the result. So now we're in this situation where we can't really hold this push. Maybe next game, build a mechanism first because then I think we could hold the barracks and we could hold the base until Phantom Lancer got big enough for us to get back in this game and fight. Now, this might sound silly, but more often than not, that person's gonna take that advice and that critique and that criticism, they're gonna say, okay, yeah, you know, I'll give it, you'll give it a shot because you approached the situation, didn't approach that person, you approached the situation at hand, you gave them simple summary of kind of what happened, and you gave them a simple idea on, hey, maybe give this a shot next time, see if it works. If they're your teammate, if they're a friend, they're gonna go, okay, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot, we'll see how it goes. If you attacked her and said, Enchantress, how could you build a hand of Midas? You're an idiot. That's not going to help. She's not going to fix it. She's not going to build a mechanism next game. She's going to be upset, and she's going to be mad at you. Um, and so let's keep going because we're running out of time. Uh, social loafing, diffusion responsibility, kind of the same thing. The idea with this is everybody in the team is not putting in 100% of the effort and 100% of the teamwork. Um, so the idea of this is we want everybody to be a part of the team, and we want them to all put in and the same amount of hard work and effort and all that kind of good stuff. So issues that increase during social loafing, uh, or issues that increase social loafing, so things that, these are situations that happen that make someone try a little bit less. So I guess a, a Dota example for this would be, um, there's been times where you're playing a game and you notice bottom lane is feeding a whole bunch and you're up top and you go, you know what? I'm not going to care anymore. I'm not going to pay attention to the mini map. I'm not going to buy awards anymore. So you're, you're playing support and your carry's not getting last hits. You go, you know what? 
I'm going to go Agams. Screw it. I'm not buying them awards. This guy's not very good. That's social loafing. That's dipping below 100% effort. Um, and so things that increase social loafing or social diffusion and kind of you know spreading that around is uh, the first one, individuals cannot be independently evaluated. This is the idea of there's not all eyes on me. I can kind of fly under the radar. Number two, the task is seen as low in importance. If our carry can't last hit, what good are wards going to do for him? Number three, individuals and groups are strangers. Now this is for kind of pubs and stuff like that. You're going to work less hard for strangers. You're going to work harder for your friends and teammates and people you respect and you like. You're going to show up and you want to do good for them. If you're playing with a guy you're never going to see ever again, you kind of don't care. You don't really care what happens to him because you're not going to see him again. That's unfortunate. That is human nature. Uh, number four, teammates that are seen in high ability. Uh, this is when you think like, you know what, all these other guys are way better than I am. So I'm just going to kind of kick back and I hope they take care of it because I'm not good enough to compete against this team. Number five, individual, individual perceives that his contribution to the outcome is redundant. You might think, you know what, we already have one support. He's buying awards. I don't need to buy awards. It's not a big deal. Uh, number six, individuals competing against what she believes to be a weaker opponent. This is probably the most common one that happens all the time. We see these really good, big, top-tier teams lose to these very mediocre, middle-tier teams because they have the sense of, we're better than them. We don't need to. We don't need to worry about it. We're gonna look ahead two rounds. You know, this might be the first round of the tournament, but we're gonna look to the semis because that's when we're gonna have to play somebody who's actually good. And then they lose to that team. You never want to discount a bad opponent. Uh, the idea to this is you want to put bad teams away. You don't want this is a, this is a tangent, which is good because we're running out of time. Um, you want to put bad teams away. If you let bad teams hang around, bad things happen. So if you're the better team, you need to just smash them into the ground. You need to put them away. You need to close out the light and don't give them a chance to get back in the game. If you let these bad teams kind of hang around, maybe have a chance, give them some hope, maybe your team gets sloppy, you lose. That's how it is. If you're a better team, you need to get out there. You need to have that killer instinct and you need to put them away. Um, but that is kind of a, a foreshadowing to another episode, which I will do in the future and kind of stepping up and uh, doing all that kind of good stuff. Then how to reduce social loafing. So this is more if you're a part of a five-man team and you think there's a guy on the team that's kind of slacking and not doing his job. These are things that you can do to raise up everybody's individual skill and make them try harder and put in more effort and all that kind of good stuff. First one is monitor individual efforts. This is like videotaping. This is like grabbing replays. You need to have ways to identify where the person is slacking and who the person is slacking. The person who is slacking is going to realize, hey, they're checking up on me if I'm doing okay, so they're going to try harder. This is a good example for this. That's probably the most common one is something in football. You have the offensive line, right? They're guys that are very important to the success of the game, but it's, you don't really pay attention to them. You don't, if you're watching it on TV, you're not paying attention to which of those guys is doing really good and who's doing their job and that kind of stuff. Social loafing comes in where you have guys in the line and they, one of them goes, you know what? I don't need to block as good this time because it's, you know, my buddy's got it. It's okay. Or maybe we're going to run to the right and you're, you know, on the left and you're going to go, you know what? I'm not going to block. It's not a big deal to run to the right anyway. So why does it matter if I block really well? I can be okay. But if you know the coach is going to watch the videotape and is going to critique you, you're going to try hard. You're not going to let that happen. You're going to go, I need to, I need to do this because I need to prove to my coach that I'm you know, worthy of this starting spot and uh, I want to be out here 100% of the time. So I'm going to make sure I step up because he's going to watch tape and he's going to identify that I'm a good player and that I put in effort, which is what number two is. Emphasize individual importance. Everyone wants to be recognized for their efforts. Everybody a part of a team, yes, they want to be selfless and they want to be a unit and they want to work together. They also want to be recognized as an individual and they want to be recognized for their efforts. So don't just discount the offensive line or discount, you know, you're, you're on a baseball team, don't just say to the catcher, yeah, he did okay, he was serviceable. They want to be noticed and recognized for that effort. So if you're part of a five-man Dota team, you know, you feel like, you know, you, you're not getting recognized by your teammates as doing a good job, you're more likely to start trying less and you're gonna try, you know, try to find another team. So the idea for this is if you're a part of a five-man team, you're going to reach out to your teammates, you know, you guys are going to go over replays together. Whoever the team captain is is going to be pointing out like, hey, support man, you did a really good job with that positioning. You stay in the very back. Or, hey, carry man, look at your CS. You did an awesome job this game. You did super good. You're at 150 CS at 15 minutes. You know, I've never seen you do that before. Nice job, man. You're stepping up. That is just simple importance recognition. It's just simple compliments, making people feel good about themselves. Um, number three is assign players to other roles. Gain perspective 
of other teammates, you gain appreci appreciation. It's very easy to play carry every single game and go, damn support, it's not buying me wards. Well, why don't you play support a couple games, and then you'll know how it feels when you don't have enough money to buy wards as much as you want to. Because sometimes that happens. And so you need to recognize the good support players who are able to juggle the money and are, are able to recognize when they can skip items in order to get wards and when they can purchase items in order to, you know, keep sustaining wards because it's that, you know, delicate balance. So you want to be in their shoes. You know, the saying is, well, you can't walk a mile or you want to walk a mile in someone's shoes before you can critique them or whatever. So the idea is you want to get a perspective of what they're going through. And so you gain a better appreciation of what they do for you and what they put in for the team. And then number four is play with peers. This goes back to the idea of you don't play as hard for strangers. Play with peers is just playing for friends, playing for teammates, people you get along with. The idea with this too is if you are playing in kind of pubs or whatever, be friendly to the people in that group and kind of make them friends. You know, make a joke, say hello, join the game and say, hey guys, how's it going today? They're going to say, hey, it's good or really bad, or whatever it may be. And you can go, all right, cool. Uh, I'm really excited. I haven't played Windrunner in a long time. I'm getting pumped. That kind of starts that dialogue, and there's that sense of like, hey, this guy's kind of friendly. He wants to be here. He, we're gonna, we're gonna be teammates. We're gonna work hard. We're gonna play together. If you join the game and you say, hey, everybody, you all suck. Just let me win for you. The teammates are not gonna try as hard. They're gonna go, you know what? Screw this guy. He's kind of a jerk. He's a stranger. I don't, I don't want to try as hard for him. He can do it himself. Whatever. Go take mid. Find a loser. Whatever. Go take mid by yourself. That is not helping teammates. People are slacking. And the goal here is you want to bring everybody up to 100% effort all the time. Because if everybody is playing at 110% effort, they're playing as a team and teammates. And on that note, let's wrap this up because this is a lot longer than I wanted it to be. But you know what? So be it. You can follow me on Twitter at Indie Finch. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-N-C-H. I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion on feedback and how to approach people and improving communication. Next week, we might be tackling leadership. We might be tackling anxiety and how to, how to deal with it and cope with it. Uh, both those topics are on the, on the table. So if you have any preference or any feedback, please let me know. You can get me on Twitter or you can uh, you know, leave comments here, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, until then, I will see you guys next time with another episode of the Dota Clinic. Time for that is over. This is Rags. Some of you cats might also know me as anemic. And I'm about to go in on this thing we call Dota. The battle begins. Let's go. I'm the man in Dota 2. We can take it to the scrimmage. And you know that I'll be winning. Just give it 30 minutes. Ganking in the lane. Hey, yo, he's in that gross. I see him trying to cut. Yeah, let's see just how far that goes. I carry in the scrub boy. He's carried in the hearse. Your tier 2 towers in your rest. Getting murked. Demolished what's in my way from the start to the finish. Like I said in the beginning, I'm the man in Dota scrimmage. I was in Dota 1. Now I'm taking it to the sequel. Okay. Demolishing my enemies. Enemies are feeble. Yeah. This is abolition. There's really no competition. Why track in the expedition? I'm ready to get